So how do we put America back on its axis before our 250th anniversary. Two people who have spent a lifetime not overreacting to today's news, who have spent their entire careers putting it all in American perspective, or better yet, talking me off the ledge. The author of American Moonshot, John F. Kennedy and the Great American Space Race. He's got many other books. And professor of history at Rice University, Douglas Brinkley, is here. We're privileged to have him, along with the author of April 1945. He's a Reagan biographer as well, and a presidential historian, Craig Shirley. So, Craig, let me start with you. Are you concerned about where we're at right now, and can you put where we're at right now in perspective with our past? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thank you for asking me to be on. No, I'm not particularly concerned today because this nation, in fact, has very rarely been united. We've always, almost always been divided. We were divided at the American Revolution. We were certainly divided at the Civil War. We were divided over our entry into World War I. We were unified in our entry into World War II and after September 11th. But those are the only times in American history that we've ever been united. We're more marked by our periods of, of division than, than, uh, than unity. Would you concur with that, Doug? Yeah, I, I do. And, you know, I, I look back, here we are, happy 4th of July, everybody. Uh, but that election of 1800, when we had two of the founders, John Adams, Federalist, and Thomas Jefferson, Democrat, Republican, just hammering at each other. You know, nobody even knew what a two-party system would look like in 1800. It was brutal. But we survived that, and we have a two-party system. Occasionally, a third party makes a difference. And I thought it was touching that both Adams and Jefferson, both who died on July 4th, Independence Day, um, realized that they needed to heal. And later in life, they corresponded uh, with each other, these beautiful letters, as you know, Brian, um, to show that even though they were political adversaries, they could become friends because they were American citizens, which is the highest calling of all. So, Craig, uh, I don't have to remind you that uh, Bush 41 and Bill Clinton ended up really being really good friends, even though it was a crushing loss of Bush 41, never got over. Bush 43 is really tight with, seems to be very tight with Mrs. Obama and even better relations with uh, Barack Obama. You know, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter were fast friends. Are we, yes. Should we take heart from that? Opposite parties, they compete, but end up not being personal because we agree on the direct, we agree we love the country. I think, yes, they agree they love the country, uh, but those are more personal friendships than ideological. Uh, on, uh, for an example, Ronald Reagan and Gerald Ford never made up. That's true. Ronald Reagan and Jimmy, Jimmy Carter did make up uh, and, and got along quite well. Into, uh, Reagan actually went to the opening of the, of the Carter Library down in Atlanta, and, and, and uh, Carter mentioned, uh, said afterwards after Reagan's speech, now I know why I lost to you. Uh, so our, 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 our politics and our history is marked by affection, division, but the affection is more on a personal basis, not certainly on an ideological basis. So I want to bring you to a moment recently which gets me really worried. It's the attack on institutions as if, if you're playing a football game and they decide that it should be nine yards for a first down. I don't know what to do with that <laughs> challenge. Here's President Biden uh, blowing up the Supreme Court overseas. Listen. The one thing that has been destabilizing is the outrageous behavior of the Supreme Court of the United States on overruling not only Roe v. Wade, but essentially challenging the right to privacy. We've been a leader in the world in terms of personal rights and privacy rights. And it is a mistake, in my view, for the Supreme Court to do what it did. Doug, just forget about the content of what he's saying overseas in Madrid saying the outrageous behavior on a 6-3 decision on unelected people that were put there through a process. Aren't we supposed to be co-equal branches of government? Do you think that's out of bounds? I think he shouldn't have said those remarks overseas. If he's going to do it, do it at home. Uh, but, you know, I, I reflect back to Franklin D. Roosevelt after he won in 1936 and in early 1937, he tried to pack the Supreme Court. We have nine justices. He wanted to make it 15, adding six new, um, you know, pro-New Deal voices. And FDR went for it. It wasn't just a theory or a, a words like Biden just said. He went for it and he got shot down and he got shot down FDR largely by fellow Democrats, particularly Democrats in the South that 
said that's way out of bounds. So uh, presidents uh, criticizing the Supreme Court is nothing new in U.S. history, and Biden is now facing difficult poll numbers and being having a Supreme Court that's basically ruled against him on guns, abortion, and the environment. So, Craig, you know what worries me most is the other area of our institutions that I led with, and that's voting. you got to accept the results of the election. And I just think, yeah, you should challenge. I understand that's not new. And I hearken back and tell me if you buy into this. Andrew Jackson, you lose a heartbreaker to John Quincy Adams. He wins the popular vote. It goes to the House, right. and there's a deal cut behind the scenes. And not only does Jackson accept it, he goes to the party after the ball left in the inauguration, and he says, you know, basically, I'm going to keep my powder dry. I'll be back. And he was. What happened to that right. mindset? Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, the, the divisions have become, you know, uh, we used to say that uh, politics in small towns are so vicious because uh, they have to fight, the, the division is so little. They, they over, what they fight over is so little. Sometimes it's little, sometimes it's big. Uh, but but th th those old style politics of uh, camaraderie, I think, are, are pretty well done, you know, because of the, because of the new media, because of the internet, uh, because of what people can say and what people can do. It's created divisions. And the two parties have changed over the last 50 years. There used to be liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. So therefore, it allowed them to compromise. There aren't those anymore. The Republican Party is almost all conservative, and the Democratic Party is almost all liberal, which means they don't get, they don't compromise on anything. The, they only get their way by right. winning power. That, that is, that, that's the way the system now. And Douglas, real quick, uh, about the election challenge. We know that Kennedy and Nixon, there was something unsavory going on there. But 2000, yeah. people never accepted Bush 40, Three as president, you hear about illegitimacy of Trump, Trump challenging this election. We have to get past this. How? Uh, I think there's a, a public debate on the Electoral College versus straight up popular vote. The Electoral College wins out. So it always throws people off if, um, you know, Al Gore, you know, gets more popular votes, but he's not the president. It, it makes people have a distrust in right. our democracy. But alas, there's a reason for the Electoral College, and I think it's going to stay. I hope it stays. I hope we start accepting results, because if we don't accept the results, then we always sit there. We never give the person in office the credit they deserve. I don't care what party they're in. All right, Craig, Doug, thanks for putting it all in perspective. Happy birthday, Thank America. You. And you guys are truly assets and on America's A-team. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.